Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 22, Nuclear War. But before I start, I want to note that the format of the show is going to change a little bit from here on out, because these episodes are starting to get more topical. Up till now, there's been a definite chronology to science fiction, even though we've skipped around quite a bit. Pulp stories were big in the early 20th century, then came the Golden Age and hard sci-fi was all over the place, and then the new wave that we're in now. But there's another side to this coin, which is that by the 60s, the genre was becoming a big tent. I mentioned in my introduction to the new wave that by 1970, hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi were coexisting peacefully. This means that a lot of the themes that first appeared during the new wave may have peaked then, but they didn't go away after that. And of course, I've already said this about the Golden Age authors, but it's even clearer now. Nuclear war in fiction is a nice, neat example of this. These stories came in two waves two decades apart. We had the early wave in the 50s and early 60s, when the arms race was first ramping up, with books like On the Beach and Alas Babylon, and films like Dr. Strangelove and Failsafe. Then, in the 60s and 70s, the world's worries were more about civil unrest, overpopulation, and environmental degradation, which we'll see in the next episode. Then there was another wave in the Reagan years of the 80s, when the conflict with the Soviet Union was pushed to the fore again, with books like The Postman, and films like The Day After and War Games. I decided it made more sense to cover both waves of stories about nuclear war in one episode, especially because this kind of thing will come up repeatedly later on. It just makes sense to group Stand on Zanzibar together with The Wind-Up Girl, or The Left Hand of Darkness with The Handmaid's Tale, or Cat's Cradle with The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In the 60s, the genre of sci-fi became less chronological and more topical, and this podcast will reflect that. Not that the chronological viewpoint is going away. While old ideas stuck around more prominently, new ideas were still coming into sci-fi all the time, and we will still be following that chronology in future episodes. But the story wouldn't make that much sense anymore if we were to keep it strictly chronological. The trope of nuclear war is obviously a product of the Cold War. The first atomic bombs, and the only ones to be used in war, were exploded in 1945. Even the idea didn't much exist before then. At least as science fact. Nuclear war wasn't solely a product of the Cold War. H.G. Wells actually predicted nuclear weapons as early as 1913 in his novel The World Set Free, even coining the term atomic bomb. And this wasn't completely out of the blue. Almost from the discovery of radioactivity in 1896, scientists had speculated about whether it was possible to induce radioactivity in heavy elements and generate possibly destructive amounts of energy even though no one knew how until Leo Zillard figured out the idea of the nuclear chain reaction in 1933. But even so, atomic bombs must have seemed as fantastical as, well, a time machine, when Wells wrote his book. And it turns out that Wells' atomic bombs didn't look very much like the real thing. In his vision, they had a trigger mechanism like real nukes, But once triggered, you essentially had a large lump of radioactive material with a half-life of 17 days. Such a short half-life would generate enormous amounts of heat, so it would continue burning with the force of a conventional bomb and throwing off deadly radiation for weeks and months. Although Wells seems to have missed the bit where any object burning that hot would rapidly vaporize itself and scatter into the atmosphere, coating the entire area with highly radioactive dust. Though he didn't know it, he had essentially invented the dirty bomb. Nuclear weapons accurately depicted started appearing in fiction pretty rapidly after World War II, but actual nuclear war wasn't as well understood at the time. George Orwell mentioned nuclear weapons being used in the past in 1984, written in 1949, but they don't seem to have had any long-term effects nor are they mentioned being used in the endless war between the three superstates in the present. On the other hand, around the same time, both Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke wrote short stories depicting humans, or at least human civilization, being completely wiped out by nuclear war. By the late 50s, we had done enough nuclear tests that we understood how things would go a little better, 
and perhaps unsurprisingly, neither of these extreme views turned out to be correct. I'm taking the time to explain the science here, because this is a common misconception. People have always said that we could destroy the Earth ten times over with our collective nuclear arsenals, where Earth in this context really means human civilization. But that's actually not true. One of the few comprehensive government-funded studies on nuclear war was done by the United States Office of Technology Assessment in 1979. That study concluded that in the event of an all-out nuclear war, about half of Americans would survive, and more in most other countries. It would be catastrophic on a level that we haven't seen since the Black Death, or the Columbian Exchange in America, but it wouldn't be an extinction-level event. Now, this was before we understood about nuclear winter, and since then there have been dire predictions of global famines resulting from a war involving as few as a hundred nukes. But those are disputed, and the important thing to remember is that things are more complicated and generally more survivable than the talking points suggest. And in fact, the most popular stories about nuclear war treat it quite differently from one another. There have been many books, movies, TV shows, and more made about nuclear war over the years. But the first wave in the 50s and 60s had a few really big signposts. Just taking them chronologically, the first of these was On the Beach, written by British expat Neville Shute in 1957. On the Beach has the most pessimistic outlook of the bunch. Shute's vision of nuclear war has the Northern Hemisphere blanketed with deadly radioactive fallout, which is slowly being carried south by seasonal weather patterns, while the surviving residents of Australia watch helplessly. I normally give recommendations on this podcast, but I'm tempted to give an anti-recommendation for On the Beach. It's almost certainly the most depressing book I've ever read, so much so that I nearly gave up on it multiple times before I finished it, even though it's not that long. Everyone dies, there's no escape, no hope, Earth is about to be scoured back to the primordial ooze, and everyone is sitting around in denial, pretending about their plans for next summer, because they can't bear to face it. College enrollment has gone up, for example, because people need the distraction. It's not a fun read, and questionably worthwhile. This kind of absolute destruction could only happen with cobalt bombs, also known as salted bombs which are closely related to the doomsday device made famous by Dr. Strangelove. A cobalt bomb would blanket the land with highly radioactive cobalt-60, which has a much longer half-life than other fallout, rendering the entire fallout area uninhabitable for decades, not just ground zero. Rendering the entire surface of Earth lifeless was theoretically within reach with cobalt bombs, though it probably wasn't practical, much less strategic. Thankfully, as far as we know, No cobalt bomb was ever built in real life. At the opposite end of the scale, perhaps the most optimistic of these early stories came just a year later with Alas Babylon by Pat Frank. And I argue the most realistic, too. The story focuses on Randy Bragg, an army veteran whose brother is an Air Force intelligence officer. When Randy receives a coded message from his brother warning that nuclear war is imminent, He takes action to protect his family and prepare his small town of Fort Repose, Florida, the best he can. Things like stockpiling food and supplies in the limited time available, and trying to stop a run on the local bank. After the nuclear strike, life goes on, showing the citizens of Fort Repose coping with the disaster, not hit too badly directly, but dealing with the lack of an electrical grid, very limited communications, and no help or supplies from the outside world. On the Beach, for all its power as a cautionary tale, feels melodramatic and unrealistic when you think about it. But Alas Babylon has a ring of truth to it that few similar stories from the time do, showing a tattered, barely functional, but surviving United States slowly rebuilding for the sake of the few survivors, facing and largely overcoming the massive problems before it. Alas Babylon is also notable for being the book that helped to fuel John Lennon's anti-war politics and it was a major inspiration for David Brin to write The Postman, which has similar themes of rebuilding society. More on that in a bit. Perhaps the most unusual of these early stories was A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller, Jr. Miller takes the long view in his book. It's written in three parts, 
each separated by a further 600 years from the war, seeing as humanity had literally bombed itself back to the Dark Ages. Indeed, in the first part, six centuries after the bombs fell, the world still looks like the Dark Ages. And the central conceit of the book is that, as happened in the Middle Ages, at least in the popular conception of the time, the knowledge of the past has been preserved by Catholic monks, specifically from the Order of St. Leibowitz, named for an engineer-turned-monk from the time of the war. Leibowitz and his followers had saved a great library of books from an anti-intellectual backlash in the aftermath of the war, and continued to protect and preserve them long after they had forgotten what the words meant. Meanwhile, the world around them is rebuilding only slowly, still racked with environmental damage and horrific mutations in the population. Slow as it is, the rebuilding progresses. Twelve hundred years after the war, a new renaissance is beginning, as people begin to rediscover what the ancient texts mean, although the renaissance similarly comes with a new schism in the Catholic Church. Yet the order persists. Eighteen hundred years, and advanced civilization has been restored, but with it also comes a new Cold War that ends in a new nuclear war and the destruction of civilization again. It's a strange juxtaposition of optimism and pessimism. Optimism because civilization did rebuild and has advanced further this time, to the point of space colonies, meaning that, with the help of the church, it will be preserved against the destruction on Earth. But pessimism because, even after learning from the past, humanity still can't help destroying everything we built again. It's a powerful book, and gets its message across well, but it definitely leans more towards aesthetic over realism. Movies about nuclear war came a bit later, but two famous ones were released in 1964, although both were based on novels, in the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Both of them were much more pointed in their political message than the books I've discussed, because both involve what became a big fear in most of the Cold War, and even nearly happened a couple times. A nuclear exchange started by accident. In Failsafe, a computer error results in a nuclear attack being ordered on Moscow. Unable to stop the attack in time, the president has no choice but to nuke New York City himself to convince the Soviets that it really was an accident and prevent retaliation. The great irony, of course, is that the title, Failsafe, refers to the orders given to the bombers to disregard later orders to turn back for fear of a Soviet ruse. It's safe for the completion of their orders. Safe for the putative interests of the United States had the attack been ordered correctly. But a better term, the term actually used for similar systems, is fail deadly. This irony plays out even more in the other, better known movie of that year, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. It has a similar plot, so similar in fact that director Stanley Kubrick sued Failsafe for copyright infringement. But where Failsafe was serious, Dr. Strangelove was a satire. Here, the attack begins when General Jack D. Ripper goes insane, believing conspiracies about fluoride in the water contaminating his precious bodily fluids, and orders a full-scale nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, the Soviets have recently built a doomsday device, consisting of many cobalt bombs programmed to explode in the event of a nuclear attack. And the attack, again, can't be stopped in time. Dr. Strangelove himself is the president's ex-Nazi science advisor, modeled as a parody of Werner von Braun, and who may be insane himself. Taking the parody up to 11, the film ends with the famous scene of Major Kong rodeo riding an H-bomb to its target, followed by a montage of nuclear explosions ironically set to Vera Lynn's We'll Meet Again, which I really wanted to make the theme music for this episode, but, you know, copyrights. You can look it up for yourself. So, these stories were kind of all over the place, but all of them, at least to some degree, were cautionary tales, which is only to be expected from the sentiments of the time. This was the first time that humans knowingly had the power to destroy civilization, and most people were not hydrogen bomb designer Edward Teller, who reveled in the idea of ever more powerful weapons. Suddenly, the idle fantasies of H.G. Wells and the pulp writers were real, and that necessitated a change from the sillier disasters we looked at in the last episode to something more serious. But by the time Dr. Strangelove and Failsafe came out, the winds were already changing again. 
The actual result of the Cuban Missile Crisis was an easing of tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. And meanwhile, people were becoming more concerned with civil unrest, the environment, and overpopulation, especially after the population bomb was released in 1968. We'll come back to that in the next episode. But nuclear war was no longer front and center in the public consciousness. Until the 80s. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president, and with his peace-through-strength attitude, tensions with the Soviet Union began rising again. This led to a new wave of nuclear war stories. Maybe the most notable of these was The Day After. Unusually, compared with our standard fare here, this one was a made-for-TV movie, broadcast on ABC on November 20th, 1983. Yet it remains the highest-rated made-for-TV movie of all time, and it was groundbreaking in its special effects for a TV movie, with its vivid depictions of missile launches and nuclear explosions followed by its equally vivid telling of the suffering and death that comes to ordinary people in the wake of the war. Even the broadcast itself was a major to-do, with no commercial breaks after the missile launches, ABC opening toll-free hotlines with counselors standing by for viewers who were disturbed by the film, and following it up with a live debate featuring astrophysicist and science communicator Carl Sagan, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel, among others. And most notably, the film convinced President Reagan himself to back off from his belligerent nuclear stance, and led directly to the signing of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. In terms of influence on the world at large, the day after is high on the list for the entire genre. But it wasn't the only one. The same year as the day after, War Games was released in theaters. This movie went back to the accidental nuclear war trope. A new military supercomputer is charged with simulating wars, including nuclear wars, but it tries to start one instead because it can't distinguish the simulation from reality. In this case, however, the war is averted after the computer is taught that, quote, the only winning move is not to play, unquote. And one book from this decade definitely makes a list of classics. David Brin's The Postman, first published as a short story in 1982, then as a novel a few years later. You may know it from Kevin Costner's 1997 film adaptation. This book was very much inspired by Alas Babylon, but I would argue it's even more optimistic. I consider Bryn to be a great optimist, even though he doesn't identify as such. I was fortunate enough to meet him at a book signing a few years ago, and my impression is that he is very worried for the future, but that he is incredibly optimistic about the possibility of progress. And that is reflected in The Postman. The story goes that several years after the war, Gordon Krantz, a wandering survivor, takes a post office uniform off a dead mailman for warmth. But as he wanders from town to town, the people there believe he is a real mailman from a restored United States, mainly because they want to believe in a restored United States. Gordon takes the idea and runs with it, first just for personal protection, but later because he sees that restarting the mail system is both a symbol that people can rally around and an actual backbone for rebuilding society beyond the small, walled communities that have survived thus far. But he soon comes into conflict with the Holnists, a vicious paramilitary survivalist group that wants to run things for themselves. Bryn shows one of his quirks here. One of his most consistent lines in his writing is his fear that the temptation of neo-feudalism and anti-intellectualism could bring down society and return us to the oppressive, top-down rule of the Dark Ages. His reasons are too complicated to get into here. Read his blog and you'll get the picture. But he takes it a bit too literally in The Postman, where simple warlords would be de facto neo-feudalists. The Holnists instead literally call themselves dukes and counts and barons, modeling themselves on European lords and ladies. But that makes no sense. If there's one thing a radical right-wing militia in America wouldn't do, it's model themselves on European lords and ladies. But other than that, it's a pretty good book that I believe shows the most optimistic view of rebuilding society after the end. Nuclear war stories can be found all over the place, of course. The Terminator series, the Book of Eli, Cloud Atlas, to name some recent ones. 
Cormac McCarthy's The Road, along with its 2009 film adaptation, is especially notable, although it's not explicitly stated to be nuclear war there. And lots of dystopian tales have nuclear war in their backstories, from 1984 to The Hunger Games. But these are the classic examples that are focused on the war or the recovery directly, and these are the ones that have influenced the genre and the culture the most on the topic. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast can be found pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. I still don't really get why that's part of the standard outro, but it is what it is. For my other writings and media, check out my YouTube page at Alex R. Howe. Maybe I should get a branded account for that. And my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for this episode is Alas, Babylon. Like I said, I think it's the most realistic take on nuclear war. It's optimistic as far as such things go. And it was an enjoyable read, where some of the darker stories turn into a slog. In the next episode, we keep with the disaster theme, but this time we'll focus on the societal fears of the 60s and 70s, overpopulation and environmental collapse. Thanks for listening.